Well, I'll tell you what is talked about too much. Trading psychology, things like that. I, it's all bullshit. <laughs> the problems that traders have is they have not developed the skill. It's a game. It's a skill game. So I always say in my trade room, I, I like if you're out there playing golf, whether you play golf or not, I think or or any kind of sport. If you're just trying to ski for the first time and you just stood up and then you fell down, you skied a little, then you fell down, then you skied a little, fell down. I doubt you get to the bottom of the mountain. And go. You know what my problem is? I need a skiing head coach. I need someone to help me with my mental game of skiing. Like, no, you don't. You can't ski. This episode of the Speculators Podcast is sponsored by Elite Trader Funding. Elite Trader Funding is an evaluation company that provides traders with the opportunity to earn income by trading in a simulated environment and never having to risk their own capital. All you have to do is pick an evaluation and follow the rules. Traders who pass the evaluation will keep 100% of the first $12,500 in profits and then 90% of all the profits after this. You can get started today with Elite Trader Funding by clicking the link in the description and using the code ETFCORBS for 40% off every evaluation that you wanna do, except for the fast track. Those are already heavily discounted by default. Now, the most important thing about Elite Trader Funding is this is a company that you can trust. They're reputable, they're trusted by me, they're trusted by thousands of other traders, and they have a 4.5 star rating on Trustpilot. They have an active Discord community, they have incredible customer service, and they have the widest selection of evaluations on the market. So whatever style of trading you're into, they're going to have the perfect fit for you. They even have a swing trading option, which nobody else offers. We're gonna say more about this later in the episode, but a big thank you to Elite Trader Funding for sponsoring this episode. I'm very happy that you're here. Let's get started with today's episode. Uncle Rod, welcome back to the channel. Always good to have you. It's been too long. How are you? I'm doing well. Am, am I the first three-peat? I think I was the first re, re, repeat. Maybe I'm the first three-peat. It's good to see you. Good to be back. I hope you're the first four-peat. Hope you're the first five-peat. Uh, okay. All right. We'll keep this going as as long as we can. As long as you we know, what's good going. now is on YouTube. A couple of years ago, you would know this. You're a big YouTuber. They they got rid of the the thumbs down button, so you can't see the thumbs down button anymore. So it's only you know we can see it, but it's only po all all good stuff. So yes, for sure. I'll tell you, yeah. you're looking uh, really sharp today. Looks like you got a, a great haircut going on. You were just talking yep. about the, the peel and everything, and yep. What's been yep. going on? You on a you on a glow up arc or what? <laughs> No. Oh, as I just told you, so I I did have a facial treatment, so I look like a ruby red, like a little bit like a beet red apple or something. But um, no, just been you know living the dream. We get to push buttons and and make money for a living. Can't ask for much more than that. You can't ask for much more than that. But for what it's worth, yeah, yeah you're looking uh, you're looking really great. Now, where are you? I feel like this is a different location. Are you back in the states or? Uh, yes. So I've been I've been moving around as I see you have. It's a fun, fun aspect of being able to do this for for a living. Um, once you develop the skill and know how to do it, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm in Las Vegas now. So, okay. you know, the lovely California State Franchise, California State Franchise Tax Board has essentially forced me to be in states in which there is no tax. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> interesting. And uh, what's going on with um, Costa Rica? Are you still there part time? Uh, yes, I have been. So the uh, I no longer have a place there uh, officially. Um, so I divested of that a little bit, but I'm, I go there quite often and uh, big success in the place in Bali. It's been rented by a 24 year old e-commerce wizard of some kind who could stroke a check for six figures for the whole year. So it must be nice. So that's uh, so uh -huh. I won't be going there, but uh the investments worked out well. So mostly stateside for a little while, but I am uh, taking my mom to Italy for her 80th birthday, which I'm excited about. Oh, 80 years old. Great run. Yeah. How long are you guys staying over there? That's a big trip. We have a, yes. So she's on a, she's on a training regimen right now, uh, walking with our next door neighbor to make sure that she's ready for, you know, some walking when you go to Italy, but we're doing 12 days. Uh, but lots of leisurely, lots of, uh, she likes to drink wine. So we'll do more, probably more wine drinking than we will walking around, but it's a 12 day tour. Yeah. Very good. And then what parts of uh, Italy you're going to the Northern part? So yeah, we're not going to, uh, basically, yes, we're not going South of Rome. So we're going to start in Rome, yes. move our way around, but uh, I planned it. I did a custom tour with a custom, you know, tour guide. And we're going to get kind of do what we want. But I really wanted her to see Lake Cuomo. I really wanted her to see Cinque Terre. 
uh, which is a special place to me that um, I'm probably going to end up retiring to and living living at. So we're going to go there and then Milan, Florence, Bologna, a couple other places. But yeah, we just won't go south. So we'll have to do Naples, Amalfi Coast and some some of that on her 85th birthday. Sure, sure. Yeah, there's so many great places to see in Italy. Uh, what a what a it's a special place. It's just a very special place in the world. I'm actually in India right now. Have you ever been to India? I have been to India. Um, not all over, uh, but I uh, got to tell you, I'm not a fan. I, uh, Goa was my favorite place, um, but there was a lot of places that I'm like, mm, I don't need to be back here. But the two of the three times I was pretty much on business meeting with developers and stuff. So didn't get to do a whole lot, but, uh, Mumbai was not my favorite spot. Sure. Sure. I just got here. So it's a little early for maybe too much of a review, but it yeah. is, uh, I'm in New Delhi and it is, uh, yeah. an incredibly chaotic place. Um, yeah. it's very interesting here for sure. For Holy sure. crap. So is it like one thirty in the morning? It is. Yeah. It's two o'clock actually. <laughs> 2 a.m. Way to go. Man. Yeah, I'm actually uh, I'm a night owl now. So this is oh, this are? is my life okay. now. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I gotcha. It's worked yeah. out sort of well the way I've been traveling where um, gradually just kind of getting worse. So spending uh, some time in Cape Town and kind of working my way this way. So starting working on the afternoons and then working into much later in the days now. So the adjustments actually been not too bad. Oh, cool. Yeah. How'd you like Cape Town? I spent uh, I spent the millennium there. Oh, very fun. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah it's great. It's a very, um, it, it's a very cool city. I think it's got some weird things, like with the, you know, the the water or the load shedding um, was interesting. Yeah, it was kind of weird to see. Just like sometimes you'd be driving down the town and just eerie. Everything was dark, and then like a random restaurant lit up here. You know, something like that. But yeah. very cool, very cool because whatever you want is there they have a pretty decent nightlife they have um some great restaurants they have the ocean they have the mountains uh just a lot of really cool things there and just like a cool vibe so it seems like a nice yeah. place to did be. you make it to table mountain um no we didn't go to table mountain okay. um we did Lionhead though oh yeah that's cool yeah yeah uh, some of my best friends from ucla were south africans so i know i know how to say some naughty words in afrikaans which is not really a language you should speak anywhere and uh, yeah, I have an affinity for uh, for South Africa and South Africans. Yeah, no, it was a great time and uh, definitely a place I would go back to. But, uh, you know, we must go on and we must go forward. Yeah. Here, Are so. you going to get to Goa while you're in India? Um, my plan right now is to I'm just doing a, a quick kind of week here in New Delhi. And then I'm going up to Rishka, Geshka, something. Um, yeah. Working on my spiritual enlightenment there. And then I'm going to do oh, nice. a week in Bangalore on the way out. So those would just be those three cities. Gotcha. Cool. It, it is unbelievably big here. So it's <laughs> it's crazy with as much as I'm traveling right now, you still feel like you're seeing so little of the actual world. Like every place I yeah. go, I'm not on vacation, so I'm mostly working. And, yeah. you know, you I, at one point I was kind of driving myself crazy of trying to see too many things. And the, the process of traveling is so chaotic that I just had to resolve myself to, OK, pick a place, make it very simple, stay there. Just just experience that as best you can, and then we'll go on to the next one. Right. <laughs> I hear you. People yeah. are probably watching but, this hey, wait, me... going, is this a trading interview or what are we talking about? This is what you get to do when you develop the skill. You can do it from wherever in the world. It's laptop lifestyle. Yeah. No, and you said at the very beginning, once you have the the skill for it, because it is it adds a whole different element into trading when you are maybe thrown into a different environment and, and you you don't have that structure of a normal routine especially yeah. on a change time zone to be working in the middle of the night. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was a real progression to even get to this place. Um, but it, no, it's special. And this was for me, the dream. A lot of people I think are extroverted or introverted. And maybe the idea of always being, you know, this mobile is not very interesting, but yeah. for me, this was always the dream. And um, it's just, it's a special season of life to be able to just, you know, grow the hair and fill the passport and not yeah, have no, to, be living in Ecuador on ten dollars a day or something, you know, staying in hostels, or, you know, getting to have a yeah. nice quality of life. Yeah, and there's you know, there's gig economy is a big thing, and there's people living the laptop lifestyle all over, but a lot of them are beholden to customers and to clients, and you know, they run agencies or do things. Not when you do what we do. So very fortunate. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Now it is good to catch up. This is your third time on. So talking yeah. about this, um, I know you got your finger on the pulse of pretty much everything. 
Um, so let me kind of in terms of catching up here, how's everything looking in the world of funded uh, funded companies? Anything coming down the pipe for regulations or everything still good in the world? Yeah, of I mean, so uh, let, let's split it off. Obviously, we're, we're in the futures world and it's good to good to see um, what I had uh, foreseen which was that some you know a number of the forex firms have gotten in a little bit of trouble and sort of dragged the whole marketplace down a little bit but uh we you know with the new resurgence of top step not that they ever went away but and i know that you're doing some stuff with them from a from a media standpoint or or um, participating uh you know they're out there in the forefront and i think that that with with a firm as big as them and it's kind of the og uh they're probably providing a decent amount of regulatory cover for the whole rest of the market when it comes to futures, you know, doing it right, keeping people on SIM for just a period of time and then putting them live and, and that whole thing. So I think that that kind of validates and, and maybe reduces the, some of the risks associated with uh, these future, the futures funding programs. But uh, whether in the U S or anywhere else, um, I would be very weary of all the FX CFD ones, even if you're outside the, the U S where a lot of people still trade those products, uh, find your way down over to futures. <laughs> Just find your way to futures, uh, mm. whether you know it or not. Um, you know those those. It's the the problem is not the firms. The problem is the product. That those products are flawed. Uh, FX is meant for big, big, big institutions. Uh, the fact that it trades trillions of dollars of notional value is meaningless. I hear about that all the time. It doesn't have anything to do with liquidity or anything. The spreads are wide. Uh, the feeds are made up. So just get out of that. Come over to futures. Uh, the future side, and I think. Uh, for the most part, things look pretty, pretty solid from a regulatory standpoint. The only things I think might go away, maybe all these, you know, multiple accounts, 10, 20 accounts that might go away at some point. Um, maybe some other changes, but for the most part, I think it's an amazing, I say this every day in my trade room. You know, I started trading in 1994, trade my first E-mini in 1997. And you might hear this from marketers a lot, like this is the best time ever to do this, to invest in real estate or gold or crypto or whatever. This is the best time ever to try to learn how to trade futures markets because you have prop programs that are low cost, a great way to learn. You have micros, which are appropriate for a lot of these prop programs until you build your account up. Um, and you finally have a growing ecosystem of people like me and Aaron and others that are hopefully tr doing it right here to, to help you along your journey and, and accelerate it for you. So it's a good time to learn about these markets. Yeah, it's interesting you said something about uh, a few things you said there. It was interesting and I've been observing this too, just top step. It was nice to see with this massive influx of uh, maybe a different landscape and seeing how they've just adjusted to that and a resurgence as well. I feel like they were really, you know, fell off there for a little bit, um, but kudos to them for coming back around. Um, and then you talked about the the flaw with um, CFDs. Could you, could you speak about this as well? Because I think there are some people who feel like they can't have access to futures, so they're trading CFDs instead. Um, it, through the prop option, I know that makes it a bit wider, but what, what is the flaw or your issue with um, CFDs? So the first issue is that um, when we refer to FX, which for a long time really was actually FX pairs, the euro yen, the, you know, the, 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 the euro, the dollar, um, the Swiss franc for a while, you know, remember the day it was unpegged and all that stuff. It was actually Forex pairs that people were trading. They were calling it spot Forex that they were trading. Um, and those products are, are for the most part fine. They come from, from actual feeds and from, uh, not really centralized exchanges, but ways in which you could, uh, believe in the data a little bit more. When these CFDs came around, I can't exactly remember. Maybe it's a decade. Maybe it's a little longer. Maybe it's a little shorter. Um, the prop products that became really popular for FX traders were things like the US 30, which, ladies and gentlemen, that's the Dow. Um, or, you know, AUG. I can't even remember. I think that's the gold one. That's the gold futures markets. So the first issue is there's no real source of truth to these things. They're derivatives of derivatives. When you're trading the US 30, that is marked against a, a feed that's coming from who knows. I hope they use the CME feeds. Um, and uh, if you guys don't know what derivative means, it means the price is derived from something else. What you want to be trading is something where the price of the s p the es futures contract is derived from the exact index in which it is a derivative of you don't want to be trading something that is two steps removed from that you can sort of see how it becomes this uh this this game where you're getting further and further away from the source of truth the other thing is that a lot of those feeds and the prices are essentially made up with really wide spreads they can get off they uh get off from uh being correlated to the proper price 
Um, you don't have a centralized exchange where the price is coming from. I mean, I, I could go on, but essentially there's just a lot of flaws in those products. And the irony now is that because US 30 or AUG, I think I got that right, um, or there's a there's a crude one, there's one for, for everything. If you're already trading that and you're having some success, and I see a lot of uh, even US-based uh, YouTubers making content about trading the US 30, come over to trade the Dow Jones. That's the symbols, the YM, and trade the actual real thing that is coming from a regulated, uh, a regulated exchange. Yeah, it seems like there might be a um, like a, a lower barrier to entry to start some of these products. Maybe it's you know it wasn't as much of a hassle to set up in the past where you couldn't. Oh, just from the for prop it. side for sure. Oh, oh, they, they, the reason they're popular is because they don't have to abide by anything. They don't have to get a relationship yeah. with any of the data providers in the U.S. Um, yeah, I mean, you can get access uh, to that data for free from many, many sources. And of course, you can see a lot of those CFD symbols uh, on TradingView and some other platforms as well. Yeah, it was very easy for those shops to set up, set up very quickly and, um, and, you know, grow and then also fall just as fast. Yeah, and I think it's worth talking about because there, if you're not careful, it seems like, well, this is easier just to get started with and a little bit of a less friction. So just kind of go down this road, but it matters where you trade and it matters what products you're trading and it's very uh somehow penny wise and pound foolish with your time to kind of quick yeah. start somewhere and just be on a bad path from that point on well you know there's trouble when when essentially fx trading well cfds are banned in the u.s um be it be what you might think if you're outside the u.s about whether you know u.s regulations and u.s trading environment is good or bad or should if the environment should be more lenient or not but FX has essentially been dead. CFDs are not allowed. Um, that should speak volumes because, you know, the U.S. is a capitalist-based economy and we want to trade everything and all the things that should be traded. Um, so keep keep that in mind. And then the other factor is that these FX firms have gotten themselves in trouble all kinds of different ways as, as well. So there was an issue, of course, with with Deal, the payout prop that, that uh, basically Deal had to run away from the entire uh, industry. So um, has there been stories like that in futures? Maybe I can think of one or two, but for the most part, uh, these futures firms have gone mostly unscathed relative to what their brethren are doing on the FX side. Yeah. And when we're dealing with the micro contract on the futures, which was, you know, uh, amazing when they launched these products out. Um, can you talk about this for just a moment? When we have a, the, let's say the MES, and then you have the ES, um, these products move, you know, virtually identical to Almost, each other. Yeah. Um, and then, but they all, they have ha having different amounts of volume. C can you just explain how the correlation works between those or if the larger product influences that micro or how they're moving or how the connection is? Well, the first thing to note is in something like the NQ, which is all I've been talking about the NQ being, I don't, I guess the term broken. I mean, we have a, a, a futures market that is is being pushed around by five or six trillion dollar companies now, right? So it, it has a certain amount of liquidity, but you can see how whippy and crazy the NASDAQ can be. But the MNQ, which is one tenth, if you guys aren't familiar, the micros are one tenth the size of their their uh, larger counterpart, which by the way, that's a mini, that's also one fourth or one tenth the size of what the one fifth the size, depending of what the bigger contracts used to be. Um, but the NASDAQ MNQ actually trades far more volume on a daily basis than even the NQ. So um, I would, if you were talking about a tail wagging a dog, but for, for the most part, you, you don't have to be too concerned with that. The 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 volume is greater in the micros in a few products, uh, and they're essentially 100% correlated. Um, the thing that I think, if we get back to prop programs for, for a little bit, the only downfall I've seen in the way these products have been structured, the since the beginning with Top Step is the concept of a notional value of your account uh, versus what you're kind of really trading in terms of buying power and how much drawdown you have, which is, you know, your drawdown is essentially 100% of your account value. There's now a whole generation of traders that have never trade live that don't even know that to trade a single NASDAQ futures contract, you need about $16,000, okay? $16,000. And they're putting you in accounts, allowing you to trade three, five, 10 of those, which would require $160,000 of real money. Now, the micro is only one-tenth of that. It's actually a little bigger at some firms, but to trade a micro NASDAQ, 
in the real world requires about $1,600. And if you're doing that, then you're properly um, capitalized for, for, for what you're doing. So I, I don't know if I got off pace there a little bit, but the products are pretty co exactly correlated. The important thing is understanding uh, the margin required to trade them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this, that's actually a very good point and uh, maybe something I haven't even thought of in the past, but the idea that if you come up and the first thing you're exposed to is a funded program, uh, yeah, you might be wildly not understanding what happens, like what goes on in the real world and how big these products actually are and what it means to put on 10 full-size contracts. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's actually wielding. Yeah. And, and what a real margin call is and, and what leverage really, what re leverage really means. I, I mean, there's a certain percentage of the market that's participating in these programs that's aware of how good they have it. So they gamble it up a little bit and they, they, they use the pro programs for what they are. But yeah. unfortunately, I think there's a large percentage that are, that are trying to do it given the rules and the sizing that the firms provide and then wondering why they're struggling so much because essentially um, they're massively, massively over leveraged from the moment they hit the button. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. We, you talked a, a few very fascinating topics about, okay, some certain flawed products and some of the importance of getting into trading a right for a right product. We just touched on understanding how leveraged we are. And, and maybe a, a lot of people aren't even aware of this when we are having conversations around trading, what are some other topics that you think they just don't ever get talked about. We talk about maybe like morning routines and how to deal with FOMO and just kind of these like topics that get beat up all over the place. But what would, in your opinion, be some topics that these aren't really talked about enough, but these are the things that are, you know, people aren't understanding or these are things that would really push in the needle. Well, I'll tell you what is talked about too much. Trading psychology, things like that. I, it's all bullshit. <laughs> the problems that traders have is they have not developed the skill. It's a game. It's a skill game. So I always say in my trade room, I, I like if you're out there playing golf, whether you play golf or not, I think or or any kind of sport, if you're just trying to ski for the first time and you just stood up and then you fell down, you skied a little, then you fell down, then you skied a little, fell down. I doubt you get to the bottom of the mountain and go, you know what my problem is? I need a skiing head coach. I need someone to help me with my mental game of skiing. Like, no, you don't. You can't ski. You know, you, you're just not a good skier. So I think there's a lot of time spent on things that are not really useful to what's important in developing um, the skill of trading. And it's also not just screen time. It has to be deliberate. You have to practice with intention and you have to practice with intention. Um, if you just, if you're trying to learn any like gu guitar and you had never, whether you watch a YouTube video or not, or had a teacher or not, and you just tried to do it kind of on your own, unless you really stumbled upon some really amazing content that showed you exactly how deliberately to move through your practice routine, you're going to hit a plateau right away and not get any better. So yeah. I think there's a lot of stuff that's talked about and emphasized and beaten into people's head. 90% of people trade, uh, fail. It's not your fault. Uh, you need to you know, understand that trading is 80% mental. That's nonsense. It's not. It's 95% uh, mechanical. Um, if you're, Unless you're going to use a machine to do everything for you, uh, discretionary point and click trading is 95.5% mechanical. Um, so I think the other things that don't get talked about enough is the concept of what are we really doing here when we mm -hmm. are actively interday trading? So, and, and by that, I don't, don't mean like what, what's your motivation or things like that. I mean, what, um, what is the real thing that we're trying to develop? What's the skill we're trying to develop? Um, and it's just risk management. I mean, I know that you hear that a lot. It's just, um, that's really all we should be emphasizing. So I came up with this concept, to, you know, didn't invent it, but it's called a daily risk budget. And really your only job as an active intraday trader is to abide by a daily risk budget at all times. If you do that, you can push buttons like a drunk monkey in between. You honestly could. It's a 50-50 chance. If you give yourself a slight edge using tools and um, processes that you teach and that I teach and some other good people out there teach, you're going to give yourself a little bit of additional edge, not huge, but a little bit. Um, and that's really the key is that so much is spent on psychology, mechanics, uh, you know, trading strategies, chart analysis, all this kind of noise, um, and not enough about all you need to do 
is follow what Warren Buffett says, and he's not even a trader. It's just he has two rules. Number one, don't lose money. Rule number two, refer to rule number one. And um, never forget rule number one. <laughs> yeah, I mean it. Yeah, guys like us can talk all day very... long, and people go, well, "I've heard that before." Okay, just implement it. Just go. Yeah, I can only lose three hundred dollars in a session if that's the only thing I pay attention to. Can I do that for three months? Never have a trading session where I lose more than whatever amount of money. You'll be way ahead of the game if you just did that. 100%. And it's that idea of just minimizing the max loss because this is in this environment yes. that, that is such a big part of our job is just cutting back on that max loss because we are in so many situations where we're wrong. We're in so many situations where the market gets aggressive, like so many dangerous, unforeseen things can happen here. And I think that concept is beautiful. But um, the way that we do that, this whole idea of your daily you know, risk parameters or your, your daily budget is an effort of just making sure that we minimize the worst thing that can happen to us. And that's a big win. You know, big yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, what you'll hear all the time is the amount of time it took me to become constantly, I mean, consistently profitable. Um, and I tell people all the time, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't, my, my profits are not consistent. They are make a little, make a little, make a shit ton, lose a little, lose a little more, lose a little, make some, make some, make a bunch of money on one big trade. Mm -hmm. That That's true professional trading when you get to it, um, to that level. The concept of consistency, the only thing you consistently need to do is never lose big. Yeah, well, well said. Nothing to add to that. Yep. What do you think about this? Because I, I probably the most popular thing that I get asked as well, and I was just talking with the trader who just randomly reached out to me and his exact words were, um, you know, I've been trading for a while and I just really need to work on my mental game. And it, I, I'm exactly right with you where I feel almost everybody and they come at this thing of trading where they're feeling all of these crazy emotional things because they are stepping into a dangerous environment that they are not prepared for. They don't have the skills for and they're doing something extremely dangerous. So, of course, they're, you know, freaking out and feeling all of these crazy emotions. And the idea is I need to figure out how to deal with all these crazy emotions instead of figuring out how do I how do I get prepared and uh, and, and capable to step into this environment? Um, why do you feel like this gets so twisted? Do you think it's because one is kind of feel good and a little bit uh, esoteric almost? And then the other one is just no frills, just work. And that's not what people are drawn to. So it's the other. Where do you think that disconnect happens? Well, again, I'm, this is not my strength. We we have a couple channels in our Discord channel uh, around headspace and mental game because, you know, I I fought against it. But finally, I was like, OK, guys, if you feel like you want to ramble on about this stuff over there, um, I rarely chime in over there. It's not this is not my strength. Um, in fact, if anything, I, I, I you know, I poo poo it. But. Uh, I think it's it's threefold. The first is, as I mentioned earlier, just dovetailing on this concept of um, these programs uh, immediately put people where their PL on the screen looks pretty big, you know, fifty dollars a point if you're talking about the s and p, right? or twenty dollars in the Nasdaq when it can move forty points in thirty seconds, right? So you know, even myself, when I see a big number on the screen, uh, I immediately have a stronger emotional reaction to it, right? And the other thing is that I think this has been proven is that unfortunately, just as humans, we feel pain at a multiple greater than we experience pleasure. So a $500 win does not feel five times better than even a $100 loss. You, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's very strange. Yeah. And on the flip side, a $500 or a $1,000 loss or blowing an account feels so much more painful than the elation or the uh, celebrating the success of passing your your first combine or, or evaluation. So I think because of that, we're natural. Many people just naturally feel that that tug and pull that you just described. Uh, I think another factor is that um, there's a lot of people that have had certain amounts of success. I mean, your your background and story is really inspiring in terms of what you can do if you really apply yourself to this crazy world of trading because in trading of course it's i think it's the only skill or sport i can think of or whatever analogy you want to use where the competition doesn't get any better like you're thrown to the deep end of the pool and if you can figure out the deep end of the pool like you have to sing your first song at you know madison square garden or whatever i mean it doesn't yeah. get any 
any uh, you know, if you're playing poker, or if you're playing a sport as you move up in, 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 in the ranks or at various levels, your competition gets a whole lot better. So getting mm -hmm. back to the second point is I think there's just a lot of people, doctors, lawyers, engineers, you know, people that have had success in other parts of their life or are used to this concept of I put in the time, uh, I practice, I'm trying to develop a skill, Rod, that's what you told me, and yet I can't figure it out. How come I can have so much success in these other parts of my life and I come to trading um, and I see, you know, some screenshots of other people, it must be, you know, I'm really successful in everything else I do. So the only thing I can think of is, you know, it has to be my head game or my patience or my discipline or, or things like that. Um, yeah. And I think the third thing is just what you just said, Aaron, it was just, just like, it's, it's just not sexy to say that the reason people aren't succeeding is because they're leaping ahead of the progression that just has to happen with something as as challenging and difficult as this uh, this world of trading is. I mean, again, like I mentioned, you're you're in the deep end of the pool from the very, very, very beginning. Even if you can swim, doesn't mean that you can you know immediately deal with the tides that are thrown at you. Yeah. And I think you mentioned it about having a deliberate practice routine and, and putting together some of this. Could you maybe just give some insights on that? Because I, I think there's a huge disconnect on, you said it earlier, what are we actually doing here? Like, what is the job? What is our main focus that we yeah. have to do? And in practical terms, like I want to get better at my trading, what exactly should I be doing? Should I be doing chart replays? Should I, you know, how do I have that deliberate practice routine that would be maybe something similar to an athlete or how would you describe it? Or what would be some insights there for everybody? Let's take a quick break from today's episode because I need to ask you a very important question. Have you ever been trading up against the hard right edge of the screen, but you're paralyzed by fear? The fear of losing money? Of course you have. We've all been there because losing your hard earned money is a very scary thing. Thankfully, getting out there to trade and having to risk your own capital this is a thing of the past. Thanks to today's video sponsor, Elite Trader Funding, you can now get out there, learn how to trade, start trading, and even make money without ever risking your own capital. Elite Trader Funding is an evaluation company that provides traders with the opportunity to earn income by trading in a simulated environment without ever risking their own money. All you have to do is pick an evaluation, follow the rules, and then you're going to earn an Elite Sim Funded account. Here, you can start profiting and you will keep the first 100% of your $12,500 in profits and then 90% of all your profits after that. And it really doesn't matter what style of trading that you're into, Elite Trader Funding is going to have the perfect evaluation for you. Whether you prefer an end of day drawdown, a trailing drawdown, something more static, they have a fast track option, they even have an option for swing trading. This is something that nobody else offers. And above all, Elite Trader Funding is a company that you can trust. You don't have to take my word for it. They have a 4.5 star rating on Trustpilot and they have verified paid out customers inside of their active Discord community. And they're paying out up to $500,000 each and every month to their clients. Now, Elite Trader Funding has an active Discord community, like I've already said, and they have top-notch customer service. So it really doesn't matter if you're brand new to the screens or if you're a seasoned pro, Elite Trader Funding is gonna help you every step of the way. Now, thanks to them sponsoring this episode, we have a really sweet deal for everybody. You can get started today and using the promo code ETFCORBS, you're gonna get 40% off any evaluation that you'd like, except for the Fast Track. The Fast Tracks are already very affordable as they are. Now, I've also got some insider scoop that starting in early 2024, they're gonna be launching out some major changes that are heavily going to impact the trading experience. So there's no better time to get started than right now. You can click the link in the description, use the promo code ETFCORBS, get yourself a 40% discount. And once again, a big shout out to ETF Elite Trader Funding for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to the episode. Yeah, I think that, um, and we've talked about this maybe on a past podcast in terms of post versus pre. I, I'm a big fan of pre versus post. If you have the time to do a lot, some cert, some amount of, of post analysis or or replay, that that's great. But you need to to first commit to how much time do you have for this, and is it possible uh, to have that time be as consistently at the same part of the trading session, ideally for what we do with stock index futures, it would be the New York open. If you can't really watch the markets for an hour before and an hour and a half after the New York open in your part of the world, um, 
or because of family or because of work commitments or because of other things, and you can't do that consistently, uh, I think you're, you're going to struggle. So what we're really doing here is we need a pre-market kind of analysis. And I don't mean look at monthly, weekly, daily charts and do all this top down or bottom up or whatever. You can quickly orient yourself around a few things based on whatever your strategy happens to be. Our strategies are predominantly mean reversion and predominantly volatility and volume based. So when you have those three things and you understand areas in which the rubber band might be stretched and you kind of approach the day that way without a bias... It's just a framework. It's not a bias. It doesn't mean you have to be biased. You should not be biased if you're trying to trade mean reversion stuff because stuff can go way higher and way lower. Um, mm. But I think the, the key is pre-market and then the ability to consistently be in there watching it, pushing buttons at the same time uh, every day as often as you can. Because if you jump around and you're a tourist or, you know, you, you're not able to do that, you're not going to really progress over time. And like any other skill, we've mentioned this a million times, unless you get repetition um, and and muscle memory, uh, if you trade for two days and then take three days off or trade for a week and do well and then come in and have one terrible day and that sets you back and then you don't want to look at the markets for a little bit. Um, I hear a lot about this like walk away kind of thing. Um, maybe it's just me. I mean, again, I've been doing it a long, long time. I understand I may be in a very different place than people. I've never had to walk away, like literally ever. I was never so stressed out or, or in such a deep drawdown or, or I just, it's never happened to me. I, I don't know why people torture themselves that way. Now, don't get me wrong. You don't need to stare at screens all day long if you don't want to, and you can make it whatever part of your life you need to, but it shouldn't be torturous or so treacherous that you, you need to you know, take three months off because, um, you know, you're just constantly beating your head against the wall. Yeah, it's fascinating to me how many people take this so casual, even from the time I got started as well. Yeah, there, you know, e e when I had to work another job before I could do this full time, I worked a job that I could do at night so that every single day I could be in front of the screens. And I think when you really understand, like, what is possible with this, and you, you make this your path, I, I can't, I, I just don't understand the idea of, few days on, few days off, kind of like dicking around with it. That has never been my experience as well. But um, your, your your comment there about the deliberate practice, this is more of a real time kind of a thing. Um, you're not suggesting somebody has a routine that might say, you know, an hour here where the market is not even open at all. And I'm just going to go back and, you know, take a trade that I placed and replay it to like perfection and just kind of get in the habit of making sure I'm executing correctly. You're not talking about practice routines like that. You're actually meaning the real time trading as you're doing it. Yeah, uh, that that for, for me, again, there's nothing wrong with that if you have time. But I mean, uh, you might have seen this as well. I, I can't even I, I, I gave up. I go back and forth on the whole journaling thing. I was a big investor in one of the first kind of big online journals. Uh, we couldn't get that many people to ever use it. The churn was really, really high. Uh, there was a, you said, you know, how people take it casually. Since I went 100% full time in March of 2011, um, before that I had, I traded my whole life, but I had had um, a lot of software jobs and other fintech jobs before it was even called fintech. But I went 100%, I'm only going to get to eat what I kill every day in March of 2011. And all the way up until 2019, um, I journaled, uh, well, I imported every single trade I meant acro made across all kinds of markets. So I had all kinds of data and things like that. And um, yeah, you just can't can't get anybody to to do any of even that that task these days. So everyone approaches this from a slightly different angle. But you know, dovetailing back on what you originally asked about when people when you talk to traders and they they have they lead with anything that's not around their process, and you ask them if they journal you know aaron ask anybody like all right tell me over the last year how many of your trades were you long or short mm -hmm. like exact i want the exact percentage because i can also tell you that if you're really not doing well more than 55 percent of your trades were short mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know th th these are little things that aren't even talked about i can look at the data if anyone even has it i can look at their data and instantly you know tell them where 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 their troubles lie um, problem is just almost no one has the data. Yeah. Yep. Um, it's one thing you mentioned before about other things you're involved with, and I know you always seem to have something exciting going on. And last time we talked, you were doing some interesting things around options. Um, 
what's the progress there or, or what's been happening with this? Yeah, I really wish there was more progress, but thank you for asking about it, which was originally, I think the last time we talked, I thought I would be able to set up a, uh, a futures prop organization that would have options, uh, futures options as a component of it, uh, both That's long right. and short, but mostly, mostly short where we would be selling, selling premium because in my opinion, there's not really a reason to be buying futures options when you have, you know, hundred Delta things in the underlying, just buy or get long or short the underlying. Um, the challenge was there was a decent amount of regulatory things and we couldn't really get the, uh, the rep, the replicator or the demo account to be reliable enough to put people through kind of a evaluation like you can with the, uh, with the underlying futures contracts. So we put that on, um, on ice for a little bit, but, uh, probably within the next 30 to 45 days. And I can actually say it this time because I've seen it and it's working. Uh, I do have a small little mini course uh, that is, you know, soup to nuts on futures on options. And I'm pretty excited that it's going to be delivered via an app um, because uh, I have, I was convinced, hopefully, since I spent much of money building the app, that people really consume content via mobile devices mm -hmm. even better than on the web and you know you've created a lot of courses i've created a lot of courses you've probably bought courses i've bought courses we're all probably guilty of never finishing them or getting through them or doing what needs to be done so this options uh little mini course will first be developed and uh available uh on a mobile app that is not just a mobile version of a website it's literally going to be an android and uh, ios app for Traders Dev Group, my education company. So I'm pretty excited about that. Okay, interesting. And not just a mobile version of the website is, um, so I'm assuming it's it's optimized and um, is it interactive or is it still mostly just like a, a consuming It's content? mostly to be viewed and watched, but it has it has a whole, um, you know, you can, we, we, I set it up such that I have an audio portion and the video portion. Sometimes they're the same, sometimes they're not. So you can essentially go on and say, hey, if you're going for a walk or a run right now and you just want to listen to me talk about some of these concepts, then you can, because you know that everyone learns a little bit differently. So yeah, yeah. and there's things that are kind of uh, native to to the app um, in terms of also the, the navigation and, and some sort of the gestures and things that just make going through the material a little bit easier. But I mean, I'm not going to over sell what it is. I mean, essentially it is a course that is just optimized and delivered via an app. Yeah. Very interesting. And then yeah. do you have more plans to do things inside of apps or is this a, a one-off thing for you? Well, I think once this app is live, you know, it'll be very easy to push, um, uh, to push all the content that I, that I create. Uh, I mean, obviously you can watch a YouTube video in, uh, uh, on your phone and stuff. And many people do. Um, but, uh, yeah, the thing is there's one f function of it. That's kind of cool. We've all gotten used to TikTok and this concept of moving like this and this. So, you know, you swipe this way and this way, apparently on dating apps, you go this and this way when you're moving through pieces of content. So, um, that will be kind of cool. Just the ability of people to quickly, get to kind of what they want to see. Um, and even our recaps that might go over a 10 day period, you can kind of quickly just scroll and, and find the, the time period that you want. I mean, we, we, we know the difference between the web and, and mobile and a lot of people are on the, the go these days, but it'll mostly just be content. No, uh, no ability to execute or, or do things like that. It's just a, a way to hopefully get people to get through the content, watch it and listen to it when they're on the go. So that's half the battle right there. Just getting people to get. Well, and you know, the reminders too, right? If you're doing like Duolingo or whatever, the thing with texting in your phone is it's always in our face all the time. So we can give, yeah. you know, you send someone an email that they haven't gone through the final module that gets lost. So hopefully this kind of in your face, more active thing will, will help people get through the materials. Oh, hundred percent. It's a very, very nice idea. And uh, so maybe within the next month or so, this will be going live. Um, yeah. Let me ask you this. Who, who is this mostly geared toward? Do you think that um, somebody should be trading this like as their primary thing, futures and options? Like this is the strategy that they're going full in on? Or do you think that this is um, primarily for like futures traders that are are looking to bring on a different product? I think it's the latter. I, I think that, um, you know, people like to define themselves as a trader that trades certain things. And as I mentioned earlier, yeah you know, what are we doing here? What we're doing here is just managing risk. And once we're managing risk, um, 
we can, you know, grab different clubs from our bag and play the course uh, as best we as best we can. So I, I would say it's complementary and supplementary. It's not meant to be, uh, oh, you don't need to trade, you know, uh, at prop programs or uh, underlying futures any bit anymore. But I don't know if I mentioned this last time. I've done a few videos on my YouTube channel. Here's the most important. If you take one thing away, you don't know anything about futures options, but you know a little bit about equity options. Here's the huge difference, okay? Equity options represent 100 shares of the underlying, okay? 100 shares of a stock like NVIDIA that goes on Friday fell $100 from its high. That's a lot of money when that represents 100 shares. Um, and it also makes it much more difficult to actually sell or go short. You have to spread very often to reduce your risk when you're dealing with equity options. Equity options I like. I trade a lot of them still. I trade more index options. Here's what makes futures way different. Futures are only assignable or only represent one of the underlying. So if you buy or sell an MES futures options contract, it is essentially exactly the same with the difference being the Greeks and the cost and some other stuff. But what it represents is just one MES contract. So if you know how to handle the risk of one MES contract, you know how to handle the risk of one MES short call or put. That is so huge. You, yeah, yeah. No, it's yeah. phenomenal. What would be, um, just explain to people, if representing, let's say, one MES or, or one futures contract. So what's the benefit to placing the trade with a, a futures options as opposed to just buying the contract or shorting the contract. So let's give an example from the long side, right? And the, um, again, I'm not going to go into the mechanics of options. If someone doesn't kind of understand the mechanics of options, this example won't make sense. But if you do, it will. Uh, let's say, Aaron, that that on your, um, what do you call your, stra your, your strategy again? You call it uh, order flow, no, uh, volume profile. You do a volume profile. The profile method, yeah. Yeah, profile method. Okay. So in the profile method, and I'm making this up because I don't know your profile method extremely well, but let's just say that you are outside the value area and you are down at an area that you would be looking for a potential long and reversal to come back into uh, into value or back up to the volume point of control, right? You, you get that. Most of your listeners who know your stuff would get that, right? So you have a long setup or a long that you're looking to do on the ES, for instance, okay? So what do you do when you're ready? You put in your limit order and you buy the ES. Let's say you buy it at 5,100, okay? In the options markets, you could sell that put, which would be about the 50 delta at the time that the price is at 5,100. You could sell a 5,100 put, now, what's, why would you do that? Well, because when you sell that put, you're instantly credited with some money because you're taking on some risk. You have a delivery uh, risk there. Um, you're instantly credited. And if you bought the 5,100 uh, and it started to go down, what are you going to do? Well, you might have to stop out of it, right? If you yep. sold the 5,100 put, and it started to go down, you have a little bit of cushion there. Why? Because you just bought in a premium. Your break even is whatever premium you brought in um, less, less what, uh, you know, what the price of the underlying is relative to the derivative. So that's the reason is that, and I do this mostly in the treasury markets with like things like the ZN, um, where if, even if I'm assigned, if I want to be long in a particular area, or I think it's going to reverse, even if I'm wrong, I don't mind being assigned at that, at that particular price. And the other thing is it makes a lot of people eventually a lot less jittery. If you're struggling with patience, you're struggling with discipline or all these things, the moment you get in the underlying, the S&P, if it's going against you and it's wrong and you're a day trader, you need to cut it. We just talked about the importance of risk budget. But once you understand that that is only deliverable of one of the underlying and you have a cushion associated, you can chill out a little bit more. Now, granted, if it goes way against you and you're going to be assigned at a much higher price, you need to close it, right? You just cover it for a loss. But... Um, hopefully that, that analogy makes sense. You're basically getting paid, giving yourself a little buffer in case you're wrong that you wouldn't have if you just bought the underlying. Yeah. And so a major advantage would just be one of the most difficult things we have to do as traders is time the market. The curse of being a retail trader is yeah. having the right idea, getting the timing yes. wrong. <laughs> Yes, and um, making that more, uh, yeah, making that more of an option of being able to um, not have to get that timing so accurate. Um, yeah. And the other thing that's great about it is once you understand the mechanics of your strategy for the underlying, again, which is general futures trading and which option to select and all those things which I can't go into now, you don't have to learn a new option strategy. There's, there's no option strategy to learn here. You simply just go, oh, I have a long or short in the underlying. I'm going to express that in the options market.
I don't have to look right. at the theta. Yeah. I don't have to look at all this stuff. I'm not trying to, you know, look at some wacky ass bell curve and say this, you know, has an 80% probability of profit. No, none of that. Just I'm expressing this trade as a short call or short put because I have a long or short signal that I want to take in the underlying. Yeah, right. And then how well would this translate into um, swing trading, maybe holding on and letting a position go for, you know, a few days or something? I think it transfers ex perfect. It transfers extremely well because, um, as I mentioned before, since it only represents one of the underlying, the margin requirements at your broker are exactly the same as if you were holding one or uh, if you were holding one or 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 the other. And again, this is for being short. Okay, I don't want to get it. If you're just going to buy a futures option, you just, your only obligation is whatever cash it costs you to buy it, and that's the most you can lose is whatever you paid for it. Uh, right. I don't think you need to do that because just buy or sell the underlying, as I just mentioned before. So yes, I think it sets up very nicely. Uh, myself personally, I always trade the the very closest expiration. So the treasuries mm -hmm. are Wednesday and Friday expirations. If it's a Tuesday, I'm trading the Wednesday. If it's a Thursday, I'm trading the Friday. If it's a Monday, I'm trading the Wednesday. Uh, the MES and the MNQ, for instance, are just Friday expirations or weekly expirations. So if it's a Monday, I'm trading that Friday. If it's a Friday, I'm trading the zero days till expiration. So yeah um very yeah and yeah and yeah the greeks will change depending on the amount of time um and the strike if you choose to ch you know get a little bit further away from the money that obviously the greeks look a little bit different but yeah it's pretty simple yeah no very interesting and i always imagined uh i've, I've done very little with options and i'm uh, maybe even purposefully a bit ignorant with it of being very just narrowed in on futures yeah. and making that my lane yeah. and you know i feel like i still have a lot to max out here and but transferring to options has always been like the the next step for me, or maybe even like a, a second step down the road. Um, and the uh, specifically the course that you're putting out um, ready in 30 days, 30, 40 days. Um, what's the best way to keep up to date with what this is going on? Is there you know, sending out announcements about this or emails or how are you keeping people? Informed yeah. I don't know if you can put it in the description of this video or what have you, but my, my website is tradersdevgroup.com. And uh, there's two things you can do when you get there. You can sign up for my futures fanatic foundation course, which is now celebrating its fifth anniversary. It's still free. Uh, just basically get on any of, get in it on any of my lists. Um, and you know you'll be you'll be well aware of when this when this happens, um, so that's probably the the best way. That's how I'm going to be promoting yeah. it. Yeah, and then I'll I'll do some YouTube content as well. So Futures Fanatic is my YouTube channel. If you if you're a subscriber to that, you'll you'll you won't be able to miss it because I'll I'll do a decent amount of content when it's ready. Yeah, very good. And then maybe just the last question. I know you said this is a getting started kind of introduction to it. Um, maybe, did I hear that wrong? Is this for complete beginners or um, is this, you know, nuts the bolts? That's a great, that so that's a great question. Know? So um, it, it it does not start at this is a put, this is a call. What it, I When you get to that first lesson, I say, look, if you don't know anything about any of that, I'll give some resources to other content, not my own. There's a lot of good content out there, both from brokers like, you know, Tasty Trade and some others. Um, and there's plenty of good content. So uh, it it doesn't start right at the beginning, you know. Uh, so, but once people have that foundation, then they can come back. And I spend most of the time just describing the difference between the mechanics of equity options versus futures options. If someone already knows options even a little bit, they can kind of, you know, get get right into it. But if not, there's resources that will help them with the the basics that they need before they uh, before they start to talk about futures options. And then they, they have my futures fanatic course too. I even mentioned at the beginning of this course. If you don't even know what a future is, you shouldn't be watching options on futures because now you're, you know, you're you're in Spanish four and you don't even know how to, you know, say hola. So you need to you need to have a little bit of a foundation. Yeah, definitely. Very exciting with this. And then just to circle back actually around um, launching out this program, what you said it, is there plans and do you think there will be a um, prop firm that offers this as well? Or is that either kind of completely sidelined for now that might not be a path forward or it's just a matter of time on that front? I think the way it's going to work is, uh, uh, yeah, I think the answer is yes, it could happen at some point. Um, What'll what'll be is it'll be a sweetener 
for funded traders. So for traders that already went through uh, a prop program evaluation and demonstrated their ability to master that component, you know, the, the, the underlying, uh, that we will approach some percentage of funded traders at some of these firms and suggest or ask if they would also like to use a portion of their capital, their capital. See, this is the way we're going to do it is rather than providing additional fu funding for it, uh, if you have capital, we'll just provide you some of the mechanics around it and, of course, give you that that payout. So people are, well, if I had my own money, I'd do it on my own. Well, the idea is it's through the structure of the program that you're already participating in and essentially on the same platform. So a lot of people don't know, like Tradeavate has had a options chain on it since the very beginning. So there's, hmm. you can, if, you, if you guys are on Tradeavate, you can go and add an options chain and pull up all the data for all the... Uh, all the CME products right there right now. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. Very cool. Well, I'll be looking forward to this as well. I'm always a big fan of anything you've created. And so it'll be nice to hear. And I'll definitely make sure that we get this link in the description. And it would encourage everybody, if you're trading futures actively and you've been thinking about maybe getting into some type of option plays, and it seems like maybe most people talking about options seem like they're just trying to take a little bit amounts of money and do these, you know, crazy swing for the fence things, but you, yeah. you know, want a place where you can really just learn about it, learn what, you know, nuts to bolts, what we're actually doing here. Um, obviously, I, I haven't seen it yet, but I would know enough to recommend it. And I would be excited to download the app myself. So we'll all be waiting for it to come out. And, uh, you know, we'll keep it posted. We'll put the link in the description where everybody can, you know, stay on board with it for sure. Yeah. I got one more little teaser if and I'll, I'll send this to your producer to you after, um, which is that uh, I, I made a investment and we'll start to be like a little bit of ambassador for a new prop program that's coming out soon. I can't talk about that, but I can't talk about the the platform they're going to be using. Uh, it's called TickBlaze, T-I-C-K-B-L-A-Z-E.com. Your users can go over there and sign up for the wait list. Uh, what we've really tried, what the, not me, what the team has really tried to do is come up with um, something that's uh, as easy to use, I don't know if you'd say ninjas is easy is e easy to use, but has all the benefits of Sierra and Ninja and all the big um, Windows based platforms out there, but also has a huge component of back testing and algorithmic trading and quant trading and automation and copying and all these kinds of things. So uh, go to tickblaze.com, sign up for the uh, it's it's the wait list is, is what it's on. And I'm really excited about introducing a new platform to the market that I think is going to I know is going to really revolutionize things. So this is an actual charting package meant to just like replace Sierra where I could you can use this. Yeah, for you can do everything charting. and it has connections to everything to rhythmic to CQG to interactive brokers to all the stuff. Uh, we're hoping that some of the prop programs will choose to adopt it, maybe white label it. Um, yeah, it's uh, and also we want to kind of make it like the the thick desktop client version of TradingView, meaning that uh, build a big community of people that build scripts and indicators and enhancements and all those kinds of things that will be available uh, for free. Um, and you know, we talked earlier about you know point and click versus automation, but also help people bring automation into their trading and and those types of things. Yeah, so it's a full on full on platform. Yep. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I tell you, one of the biggest frustrations is trying to learn Sierra for people over inside the profile method. And uh, it, it's just such a unuser friendly experience. And yeah. yeah, I'd be interested to check this out myself as well, because um, it, it does seem like there's like this missing gap a little bit where there's just something like Ninja Trade or uh, something like Trading View, which is great for what it is, but it is just like extremely retail and it, it's very limited in what it can actually do. Uh, and then there's yeah. probably like Sierra, which is just so daunting for somebody to come in and try to learn about trading and then also try to learn this charting package that's so unuser friendly um, that realistically takes weeks <laughs> to really be able to navigate it around and become proficient with it. Um, so, yeah, you've definitely identified something in the marketplace that I wish somebody would come along and fix. But good Lord, it is so difficult to create something like this. Um, yeah, and, 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 and don't don't get me wrong. It, it's it's going to take an effort for anyone to learn a new platform. I mean, um, we're really excited. Uh, you know, not that I wish the worst on anybody, but you know, MT4, MT5. Remember, we started our conversation really quickly with what's happening in the world of of prop firms. FX 
is is such trouble that literally MT4 is is running away from them as well. You know, the most popular platform in the world. So there's an opportunity there on the FX side as well for all of you FX traders. Go to TickBlaze.com and, and sign up for the uh, the pre. Yeah, we're pretty ex we're pretty excited about it. But it'll, it'll there's going to be a learning curve to learn to learn anything. But I'm geeky and I love the fact that we'll be able to uh, to help people get to that next level too once they're done with just always point and click to get to the point where they automate a lot of their logic and entries and can really back test and know their strategies and copy in a reliable way um, without a third party plug in. So lots of good stuff. Very good. Always having a lot of irons in the fire and uh, it's always interesting to hear what you have going on. So thanks for explaining it. We'll be looking forward to little teaser that you put out as well of uh, yep. maybe some new affiliation that you have going on, but definitely enough for us to look forward to now. So big thanks for coming on. Always great to talk with you. And I, so many things you said at the beginning, I, I know you're just talking, um, but the amount of experience that just comes through, it's just great to sit back and hear. And uh, I'm, I'm always glad to have you on. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for having a part. I'll give you the final word uh, before we say goodbye here. No, I really appreciate uh, I really appreciate the time once again, and uh, uh, I don't know what your circadian rhythms are doing, but hopefully have a good rest of your night into your your morning. And uh, yeah, without sounding too cheesy, folks, just think risk first. Uh, you, you, the most important thing you have in this game is really your emotional capital. From a guy that said it's not about a mental game, but you got to keep your emotional capital uh, intact, and you do that by just sizing things appropriately, thinking risk first, and not making this something that you dread. You should enjoy the uh, the experience of of developing the skill over time, and dare I say, even have fun with it. Great words. Thanks again, Rod, for coming on, and we'll be talking with you soon. Have a good one. Be good. Bye bye. Bye bye.